Ah, welcome back. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and this is uh, Coronaville. What's next? Um, and of course, Coronaville is linked to all the other Trump issues. So, but let me just uh, open by saying, you know, we we have a problem, Houston. Uh, we it's it's shooting up logarithmically all over the country. Uh, the Trumpers don't seem to recognize that reality. Uh, they get involved in these uh, super spreader events, like what happened last Wednesday, and they, we got cases upon cases. Um, and then we have a failure of the government in distributing the vaccines. Um, this is all turning bad. And yet, and yet he has managed to keep, you know, himself at the top of the agenda. And the, the media is reporting on him and only to a small degree on the relatively small degree on the coronavirus. So I just wanted to ask you guys, uh, let me let me start with you, Tim. As Tim Apicella, Stephanie, uh, Stephanie Dalton, uh, Cynthia Sinclair, and um, Winston Welch. I'd like to ask you, Tim, what has Trump, that is the administration, that the United States government been doing, been doing about the coronavirus in the last few weeks? Well, thanks for having me on, Jay. Um, nothing, absolutely nothing. Uh, you know, they abandoned, they abandoned the try to quell this virus a long, long time ago. Uh, in fact, we, we discussed on previous shows that we, we, we think that they were trying to encourage herd immunity. And that's why they've done nothing. They wanted to encourage more people to get it rather than discourage. Uh, and I use as my evidence all the spreader events that Donald Trump held before the election and all the spreader events he's held since the election. Um, so as far as a coordinated effort from the federal government, uh, very, very, very little. And, it, and it's, it's remarkable, isn't it? And they're complicit in the, the thousands of deaths that have taken place. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> they all have to go, don't they? Stephanie, we have problems in the River City on this too. An article in Civil Beat about our failure to organize a distribution system. What's that all about? Well, people are very, very frustrated, especially the folks that are still in the 1A category. 75-year-olds um, are outraged because um, they made the grade and age and, and they can't get any service. So I've called uh, Queens, I've called the health service and they, oh, well, we don't know. I've called Straub. Well, we don't know anything about what's going on. And the plan is to set up uh, what they have put out in the publicity uh, is that the plan is to have a distribution down at the Aloha Tower. Uh, there's evidently a big hall down there for taking visitors from ships and all that. But then also over here at the Neil Blaisdell. And they say you have to have an appointment and fill out an application. Well, there's no information on where the appointments start. There's no application when you hit the link. So they're just scampering to try to get this stuff together. And I don't understand why the lieutenant governor wasn't on today because he was off giving another talk. And so I think that they've really they're drop they're, they're dropping the ball or something's in the way of getting this finished yeah. up the first okay. tranche of people in 1A. And so they're Cynthia, not- Cynthia, how much of this is the fault of the federal government? I mean, our failure here in the state to have a, a rational systematic distribution system, is it our fault, their fault, or both? I think it starts with the federal um, level and then sort of goes down to the state level. But the state has, I mean, if the federal, has messed this up so bad that I think you know every state is having to just sort of scramble. So even if they had the best plans in place, because of what's happened with the federal rollout, they've had to scramble and readjust. And so Hawaii isn't the only state that's having these troubles. Everywhere is because they're having to to just sort of on the fly replan everything. Uh, I was well, at to go back to uh, uh, Tim's point, you know, it's it's the final thrust. It's the A2 Brute that we have this uh, fantastic epidemic going on. And yet, if, if I'm the governor of Michigan, I'm not going to be paying any attention to that at all. I have to survive my state house. I have to survive my administration. I have to deal with the risk of having thousands of um, insurrectionists uh, burning my capital down. I'm not going to spend any time uh, on COVID, even though COVID is much more of a threat to the population. So Winston, let's let's turn to you. Let's let's 
let's talk about what's going on these days. Um, where are we since, this is a hard question, and I, ho I hope we can do it within the, the bounds of our show. Uh, where are we these days, given the, you know, the, uh, the, the fantastic uh, insurrection last Wednesday? I mean, have we, have we really made progress in terms of getting rid of Trump? Uh, oh, okay. You threw me. Well, number one, there's never enough time to cover these topics in our show. That's guaranteed. <laughs> um, but back to before I get to that point with, with Trump, I think Donald Trump is here to stay with us just like coronavirus for the rest of his life and beyond. Just like Moderna's uh, CEO said, coronavirus will never go away. And I think um, there's some parallels in that. Tim said it right. They have sort of just given up and said it's herd, uh, herd immunity now. One in three people is infected in LA, estimates show. That's uh, from the LA Times today. 90,000 more Americans will die of COVID uh, just before about the beginning of February. We're, we're at 4,000 people a day. Think about that. That is a 911 event, more than that, every single day. Um, if, you have, if you've had COVID, you only get protected for about five months before you can get it again, on average is what um, a study in the UK says. And we're looking at um, mass disaster in the next few weeks. It says if you don't need to go to the store, do not, what well, you don't need to go to the store, have your groceries delivered, especially in if you live in the mainland here in Hawaii, it's a little bit better. But like Stephanie said, it's confusing. And I've read reports. I was at uh, Kaiser the other day uh, dropping someone off and there was a line waiting out there. So what's this? And someone, I don't know if it was true or not, but someone said, oh, they're giving out COVID shots. And it was all ages waiting in line. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And he says, yeah, they're, they're giving them out to anybody. I said, anybody, do you have to be a Kaiser member? He says, no, you could be anybody. I don't think so. And, and they're just taking all ages. And I thought that's, that can't be true. But then I read in uh, the paper today that if you hang around Safeway or CVS, that when they get to the end of the day and people haven't shown up for their appointments, that they have that extra vaccine. So people have now been kind of camping at Safeway and CVS, which doesn't help either. So I think once we get these mass sites established, look, we're going to have a new government in six days. And they have already, it, it, Joe Biden's hand is going to be tired from signing stuff in the first hour of his presidency to get this as right as possible. But we are in for a world of pain in the next few weeks. They said it's going to be worse than it's ever been. It's a disaster. I'll go back to my question. Are we rid of Trump? No. Uh, but he's been marginalized. He's been effectively, um, you know, it's the, 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 the corporate scarlet letter of being silenced uh, by Snapchat now, even Snapchat, uh, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter. Uh, it, it, his message is not going to get out in the way that he has thought it would, but it will get out in other ways. Is he going but to be impeached? He will be impeached. I imagine that he will be convicted by the Senate, but then there will be constitutional questions that come up and say, does this stick because he's not in office anymore? So certainly this will be going to the courts later on. But the main thing is that his, I don't know, I just read another report that said today he's still more popular than Senate Rep Republicans. And it was this today's report, I can't remember if it was political, so 40% still support Donald Trump. When I just thought, Good gravy. How is this man still getting well, any support? But um, he is. And so the, the Republicans are having to do their dance, but their party's just being ripped in two for the people that are uh, in a personality cult versus traditional Republican values. And I hope the latter is able to resurrect themselves because we do need a principled conservative party in this in this country, uh, just like we need principled uh, Democratic Party in this country. So, um, yeah. Okay. Well, Tim, uh, you know what about what about getting Trump in jail? I mean, I think it's really question. It's a big question about whether he's going to be removed from office and whether his perks will be taken away. I, I you know, I mean, I'd be interested in your thought about that. But at the end of the day, is he going to jail? You think he will? At the end of the day, yeah. And I'll tell you who's going to do it. Uh, virus, um, uh, Vance, uh, Cyrus, Cyrus Vance, the Southern District of Manhattan. I think he's going to um, 
move forward on all the various charges that they've been waiting to do since uh, since he'll leave office. And as far as his perks and whether or not he could run for office, I think there's are provisions in the 14th Amendment that allow that to happen. It's not just paragraph three. Um, paragraph five, that I, I listened to some constitutional attorneys and they said, paragraph five allows the Congress to pass new laws in order to implement the 14th Amendment. And so Congress, there's nothing that prohibits Congress from passing a law that specifically spells out, A, you shall not uh, run for office again, hold public office, B, all, all presidential perks that were awarded to you or have been will be stripped. So you can further define that so that if it does be, if, the, if, if it's challenged later on in court, um, you'll have new law to further clarify that which was intended. Yeah, that would be good. Um, what about federal federal prosecutions? You think Merrick Garland will go after him? Will Biden go after him? Well, Biden doesn't have a say in it. It would be uh, uh -huh. up to, that's well put. <laughs> yeah, it's up to the Department of Justice, and and Biden said very clearly, I you you know you answer to the the rule of law. You do not answer to the president. Gee, too bad William Barr didn't understand that point, but um, I think Merrick Garland will. And I, I I personally think Merrick Garland will look at what laws were breached and uh, follow his duty. So Stephanie. Where are we with the Republican Party? It is extraordinary, is it not, that all these uh, Republican legislators um, have demonstrated they're still loyal even now, today, even now, today. 197 of them voted in favor of Trump yesterday in the House. Where are we with them? Why are they still mm, loyal to him? Well, I think that, um... It has all been built up, as, as we've talked about before. It's not just Fox, but there's this capillary system of radio uh, programs that are, have just been pumping and, and humping on all of his, his uh, themes and tropes and everything plus Twitter. So I think that there'll be some diminution of all of this as we go forward, but and, and mostly because now the financial context, his financial context is coming to pieces. Even Deutsche Bank is not lending him any more money. That's what they say. So what happens? I don't know. But all of the uh, New York City's canceled all of his contracts. I mean, he did do one good thing with the skating rink there in Central Park, which uh, but but it brings in a yearly income that the Trump boys are taking care of. But all of those income streams are now getting um, dried up because they're saying that they will not continue to pay for uh, to someone's corporation who's had criminal activity and this violence in the capital and all of this is, amounts to that for them. So you know what? I realized that Trump has never had, after reading Mary Trump's book, do you agree with me that Trump has never had a job? I'm thinking <laughs> he has never had a job. Oh, not no. even that he's not been in gov, government, but we are working with somebody that truly has no conception. It's like the Secretary of Education now departed and um, has never been in a public school classroom desk in herself or with her children. So, I mean, we're up, we have, there's some unraveling, unwrapping of uh, wow. some you know, stuff. Yeah incredible so and there was that, that, that one congressman was going on about working at mcdonald's and like for these guys that are all dressed up in these outfits or wearing their mask and saying you know if you work for mcdonald's and you've got to wear the uniform or whatever they tell you to wear otherwise you can go find your job someplace else and that was when it hit me like a ton of bricks <laughs> he's never worked at anything like mcdonald's and no oh no he hasn't worked at all because he's been with dad Mm. He's, he's had the deal of a lifetime. But anyway. Yes, so he has. Maybe he'll work in the cafeteria there in the prison. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so here we have a question from a viewer. I'm, I'm reading the question. Let's see if we can uh, deal with this. Multiple state officials got COVID from Republicans who refused to wear masks uh, in the bunker <laughs> during the Capitol attack. Um, is it just Republican to deny COVID or are they too influenced by Trump? That's an easy question, isn't it, Cynthia? <laughs> I know, yes. It was, um, 
outrageous as I watched them refuse because they're on camera refusing to take the masks that are being handed to them. It's not like they just ended up in the bunker with no masks. No, they were given masks and they refused them. And that's what just really taught me a lot. And so I believe that they are under the power of Trump. And, you know, we were talking a little bit before with Stephanie about the psychological elements of this. And lots of people are likening this whole thing to a domestic violence situation as an abuser. It's as if so many people in America have been in a relationship with a, a domestic abuser and they're, they're frozen sort of. And, and he used, very intentionally used all the specific things that abusers use to cow their victims, right? And to, to you know, put them in the corner and to make them doubt themselves and to make them not believe in anything but that one person. It's that, that sole proprietorship like you were, like we've been talking about for so many years here with him. And it's that that I see. So there's gonna be- Well, this sure, and let me ask you this though. Let's assume for a moment that it's a good analogy. Um, you know, that um, abuse um, and harassment, sexual abuse, harassment in a domestic setting shows you the same elements as what Trump and, and uh, his enablers have done really to the country, to 70 million people. Uh, what can we learn from you know, the sexual abuse and harassment uh, that we can apply in trying to you know, correct the problem, correct the, the thinking of 70 million voters who voted for him? Well, the, the whole thing that, that is the first part is that they have to convince you that what they're doing is not bad, that the problem is yours, not theirs. And so we've got to, I think that's where having consequences for what he's done will really help a lot of the people be able to split away because they'll be able, they'll be able to see, oh, it wasn't me. It was, it was him. Maybe I, I can believe in myself again. Maybe I can trust things again. And that takes intention too. So it's going to take intention from the media and other politicians to come out and talk about this. Impose and limits. Yeah. When I was a counselor in summer camp way back when, before you were born, um, we, when we found a problem camper, uh, our mission was, this is a social work camp. So we really thought about these things. Our mission was to try to put constraints on that person, to put limits and to state the limits and then enforce the limits. I don't know if that still works now, but Tim, I wanna ask you to make the analogy, and actually we're gonna have a show about this later today, make the analogy uh, with the tricks uh, that Hitler used in coming to power. One of them was uh, scapegoating minorities. We know, you know the horrible things he did there. Um, the other was propaganda. And the third one that comes to mind is uh, the big lie, the big, huge, repeated lie. These are hauntingly similar. And so um, query, how similar are they to you? Are there other similarities we should learn from? And finally, my bottom line question on this is, is what can we learn from what happened in the 30s in Europe that we can apply now in order to limit this possibility again? Oh, great question, Jay. Um, first off, before the big lie, which let's identify the big lie, that the election was stolen from Donald Trump. That's the big lie right now. But before the big lie, remember, we had 30,000 some odd smaller lies that people became um, desensitized to. Lie after lie after lie. And even though they were identified as such, you couldn't keep up with them. And, and, and like anything, human nature is to say, I can't process these numbers. I can't, I can't grapple with the daily exposure to something that's a lie. And then when that lie is repeated over and over and over again on Fox News or any of the, the, you know, the local media circuits, um, it's no longer a lie. It's just a, it's, it's something that they accept. And so that when it comes time for the big lie, um, that is accepted as well. And that's something that Hitler did very effectively with Goebbels uh, and, and was completely successful in it. And so now the point is, um, Donald Trump has pulled it off. He has poisoned 74,000 Americans. 
flip the big lie. And what was your last part of the question? I'm sorry. What do we do? What do, what can we, by the way, it was 74 million Americans. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm correct. On that. Um, but but um, what, what, do we what do we do? What do we learn from what happened in Germany? The whole affair with Hitler and the war and, and his deception and lies to the people and how he, how he got them into his way of false thinking, um, which is so similar, in my opinion, for what Trump has done. What, what have we learned in making the comparison, assuming it's a valid comparison, that we could use now to defuse all of this, um, this uh, alternate universe lying system? Okay, it's happening now, and it actually has been happening for since the election and a little bit before the election, and that is uh, limit the oxygen that Donald Trump has been given through the media sources. Limit the oxygen, identify the lie, and, and quit giving the, this, this autocrat, this would-be dictator, the airtime and oxygen that he so craves to spread his lies. And that's happening now, and, and it's happening exponentially now with the... Um, with Twitter uh, locking him out, Facebook you, and all the other But you know, he's media. trying to get other social media to uh, to use in the same way. Maybe they're smaller at, at, at first, but if there's 74 million people interested in finding them, they will find them. And so, so a, a Twitter by some other name will emerge, don't you think? Yes. And, 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 and you know, that's where I've mentioned other comments about the FCC. Uh, new laws have to be passed about standards. Standards of broadcasting, um, you know, the, the knowingly and overt publication of a lie. And, and, and until that's done, uh, it's the Wild West again. And, you know, remember back in the 50s and 60s, there were some standards of broadcasting that were enforced. And it looks like the enforcement of, of some of those rules have gone by the wayside. Yeah. Well, uh, Winston, before we get to, you know, a moral solution, um, uh, a solution of dealing with public opinion propaganda. We have, we have those um, National Guardsmen sleeping in the Capitol, um, which is really a scene to, to remember for the rest of our lives. And we have those fences and we have 15,000 and more. And we have, um, you know, public officials making statements to suggest that, in fact, they gave them instructions. They said, you have there's some general, you have live ammunition, you are going to be carrying rifles. And if you feel you need to defend yourself, you may shoot, you may engage, you may shoot that weapon. Um, what's going to happen here? Um, are we going to have a, a, a shootout at the OK Corral here in the next few days, the next three days? Well, there's there's corrals everywhere around the nation. There's 50 state capitals. There's, there's a giant city halls. There's all types of uh, federal, state, and local entities that are on edge right now. I don't, I, I, there, there are loose cannons, certainly. It's not the majority of people. It's not the majority of Trump supporters. It's not even a small minority. It's a tiny minority that can rabble rouse. Um, they have assault rifles. And if yes, they, they start do. shooting, if they start the, shooting at the National Guard, guarantee the National Guard is going to shoot back. Yes, they will. But hopefully uh, all sides will exercise restraint. But, you know, we do have the rule of law here. And the law says you may not take over the government seditiously. Uh, and we have elections that have been carried out. And now to Stephanie's point or to your point where, you know, almost 200 people who swore an oath to uphold, protect and defend the Constitution of the United States after being almost could have been held hostage or killed by these same people continued to uphold and vote um, against impeachment is astounding. And what that says that you were mentioning this, Cynthia, I, this is this is like a Stockholm syndrome, really, isn't it? They have they're either afraid of their constituencies or they're actually believing what they're being told, which is scarier. Um, and I, I think that we're going to have reckonings all across the country. There's corporate reckonings going on right now where they're saying, we're not giving you any more money for your elections if you voted for this way. Not just Donald Trump, all the way down the line. But interestingly enough, I was looking at a, at a poll that, that came out that said Ted Cruz is overwhelmingly supported in his own district uh, by, by Republicans uh, and in his district. Uh, Mitt Romney's at the low end, but he's supported by twice as many Democrats as Republicans. Look, there's an article in, in Axios that says top Republicans want Trump done forevermore. They just warn against making him Jesus. Uh, at NPR, great uh, uh, 
Hill's article called How Did We Get Here? A Call for an Evangelical Reckoning on Trump. This has to bleed throughout the nation so that we find that 74, 75 million people that still are thinking in this way, we have to reach their hearts and minds to let them know how we got off track and how we get back on track. How do we do that? How do we do that, Winston? Very noble. I'll tell you that that? right now, Donald Trump's not going to prison. Uh, That's not going to happen, but he will be investigated. He will be censured. It will all come out. Uh, Tim's you know, thought of when we used to have, uh, I don't remember what we called it, fairness in, in, in media or something where they had to report both sides, whatever that is. That's not happening either. We have to remember, you mentioned Goebbels and Hitler. They were masters at it and they only had the radio and uh, leaflets and newspapers. Almost every single newspaper in this nation that I can remember in 2016 said, this man is a nightmare. Do not elect him. And he was still elected. Where Facebook and algorithms and, uh, and these social media sites and Fox News, they are so manipulative, our emotions and our thoughts and, and feeding us exactly uh, in a cycle, they make Goebbels look like a kindergartner. So we really have to go back to those very basic things and say, what is your culpability as a social media organization? As a as a news organism, purported. How, news how do we do that, Winston? I mean, it's, well, I let me I, go think, to, let me go I don't to know. That. I don't know how we do that because we do have freedom of speech in this country. But at some point, maybe it comes down to the almighty dollar and Kellogg's or or um, you know Ford saying that, we will not advertise on either. your network if yeah. you continue with this. And we've you seen let mass it go organic. You know, it's not going to happen. Well, we've oh, seen so mass Cynthia purges over the last shaking her head. Yeah. I'd like to get to her way, way in on this. Well, we, we have seen mass purges, and I think we're moving in that direction. But we've got a lot, a lot of work to do to shore up our institutions. Um, he said like purges, said, Cynthia. What do you think of purges? Yes. <laughs> yes, there's a lot of people I can think of that I'd like to purge, for sure. <laughs> you know, as far as the FEC rules and regulations go, they just had Tucker Carlson up in court not too many years ago because he was spreading misinformation, right? But they said it was just opinion, not a news station. So that's when Hannity and Ingram and and Hannity, that's how they were able to keep their jobs and they didn't get censured or or silenced because it's just opinion, right? So there's gotta be more strict rules. I agree with Tim, we need to really define those rules more, more succinctly and more specifically and we have to enforce them by so, saying stephanie I, I don't i don't see the republicans i mean it's it's aspirational to think that we can change their minds and bring them over to the you know the light at the end of the tunnel um i think it's a project that takes decades of of education if that's your specialty um around the country where we we take we take people who come from neighborhoods that have gone to Trump and we show them they got to use critical thinking, all that stuff that the schools have to be better. And maybe, I mean, I'm interested in your thought about, maybe this is already happening, but it's not easy and it's not quick. What are your thoughts about how you change the way these, these people who appeared in the Capitol or these 74 million people, how do you change the way they vote and think? Well, I, I think we have two, we have a couple examples briefly of lies that didn't get told or one example of a lie a major lie that didn't get told and that was right at the beginning and it involved major markers and clear evidence that there was only one truth okay so the first one the lie was about the size of the inauguration audience for trump okay so he went to obama's stuff looked the picture oh look how many are there and then he went to his and they had that white thing out on all the grass so that they were doing something to make the grass better and that showed that that was his inauguration shot no getting away from it except the next day all the women and the women's marchers came to town by the millions and filled up the mall and they were to go to tim's point it started there or even before i mean trump was a liar when he was in real estate way back when the way he dealt with the media i mean we knew and we saw the new york times counting 10,000, 15,000, 20,000, 30,000 lies we should have known then 
Well, but yes. What could we have done? Markers, because what the reason that he didn't use the women's march as his audience is only because they were wearing the pussy hats. So if the women had not had pussy hats on, those pink things that show up in every kind of footage, he would have used that that footage for his inaugural event because the entire mall past the monument was jammed. So we the lesson here is to wear those hats. You uh, Tim, you've been you've been bursting at the seams on I've this. I've been bursting at the seams and I'm sorry. Um, but look. <laughs> It's time, it's time for the FTC to make a rule, and that is make a clear delineation between news and commentary. When Walter Cronkite came out after the 10 offensive in 1969, he went from being a newscaster to a commentary. He made a verbal announcement to that, but that's not good enough. What the FCC needs to do is require a banner at the top of the square and a banner at the lower, the lower part of the screen that you have now went from news to being commentary. And that goes for CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, you name it. Uh, it needs to be um, across the whole spectrum of news reporting. Yes, that's really and okay. That but uh, you know, you're you're you know, see yeah. one of the one of the really subtle, awful, nefarious things that has come out of Trump's uh, attacks on the press and his uh, in, enormous number of lies all the time, increasing in scope and magnitude and outrage. Um, is that it has stretched the First Amendment. It has made the First Amendment, it has put the First Amendment under attack. If you call on somebody to define between opinion and fact, where's the line? It's going to be hard. You got to start somewhere. Uh, it's got to be somewhere, but you, you know, we have to find a system. My, my statement, my thought is that the First Amendment, as we knew it, as we understood it, uh, from Hugo Black, which, you know, you can't fire, you can't cry fire in a crowded movie theater is very simple. Um, that's over. The First Amendment has been damaged beyond description in the course of this administration. Okay, time for closing comments. Stephanie, let's start with you. Summarize what we've done here today and where we're going in the next week. This has been a most informative discussion, hitting all of the high marks that needed to be met. And going forward, we're going to watch as um, Trump's prerogatives uh, and, per and, and perks are going away. He's not going to have them. And we're going to see more bad behavior. So hang on. We're not there yet. Yes, it's only a few more days, but those are days. That he hang on, hang on. Winston, get, you know, can we afford to hang on? I mean. What, what's it going to be like when, when we put the, uh, the troops next to the insurrectionists? They could have a America is burning civil war kind of week, couldn't we? Uh, we could, but it, I don't think it's going to. I, I, I hope that it doesn't happen. And at the end of the day, as far as First Amendment rights go, uh, the almighty dollar is done, going to uh, prevail because these corporations are afraid of getting sued if they or by their shareholders and or by putting out information so kellogg's ford whatever they're not going to be given the dough anymore and that is what's going to control a lot of first amendment stuff going forward from now and that will bleed over to the networks and all that that said i don't have a tv that i watch network news on i get it all on the internet so i'm probably like a and and they and and the younger people um I, I i don't know if they're getting it from TikTok or or, or where so you're right, that genie's out of the bottle. Um, education, the almighty dollar, I don't know. But hopefully this week, people will show restraint, as I said before, baking soda, baking soda, baking soda all around. Everyone needs to calm down and, re and, and regain our sense of propriety and uh, rightness. Cynthia, why don't we just go on a blackout for the next week and, and not see anything, read anything, hear anything, and take a, a, a one week nap and then wake up and see what's what's going to be at the other end of it. What, what are you going to do? Um, no, I actually, I already took my nap back when the studio. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm okay. I'm refreshed and I'm ready to go. I think with consequences, well, with accountability, all, accountability for all of them, not just Trump, but all of that. Jim Jordans, and when I say Jim, I mean G-Y-M, Jim Jordan, and all of the Lindsey Grahams and the, the people that so voicefully supported all of this mishigosh, as you like to call it, um, 
So I think there needs to be accountability and then there needs to be consequences. And, and until that happens, there can't be any healing and we will not reach any of those people. There might be a few Republicans that voted because they liked the money that they received. Um, and so they're starting to pull back because they're like, whoa, I don't know about this whole take over the government thing. But most of them are still under the power of Donald Trump. Yeah. And oh, yeah, that's a true fact. You know, so so, Tim, you know, we've, we've had some good events here in the past, you know, like Biden won. Right. Although some people don't believe that. Biden won. Um, the, the two Democratic uh, senators in uh, Georgia, they won. Uh, Nancy is still in place. Um, they did Im impeach the bugger. Uh, that was really terrific. Um, these are good things. So, Tim, how, how are you feeling? I, I'm feeling very cautious. Um, you know, I'm a little concerned about what transpires between now and the inauguration. Uh, but I'm optimistic. And the, the reason I'm optimistic because the system actually ultimately worked. The mm -hmm. democracy held. We voted someone out. It was a fair election. And as time goes on, his power will diminish. And as we've said on this show before in other shows, you know, um, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. There you go. That's it. That's the lesson of all of this. You know, uh, there will be a time when it cools off and we won't have Trump to kick around anymore, to use the phrase about Nixon. We won't have Trump to be on the headlines every day and every minute. And the news will not be as exciting. It will not be like a 24 hour reality show, which he has achieved for us now for four years. And the question is, will we still have opinions? Will we still be interested? Will we still participate in the, in the national public conversation? And the answer is, we better bloody well do that. <laughs> Whatever happens, you know, uh, yeah, vigilance. It's all about vigilance. Thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Winston. And thank you, Cynthia. Don't forget, your next show on Rediscovering America is on probably the most important day it could possibly be, the day of the inauguration. Wow, exciting. Are we looking forward? Well, in many ways we are. Thank you so much, you guys. Aloha. Thanks for the plug, Jay. Aloha. <laughs>